I still can't believe where we just got to. Look at this incredible place. Look at where we are right now. One of these Bajau settlements in the middle of the ocean and surprisingly built directly over the sea. These are the amazing, truly incredible and almost superhuman powers of the Bajau people. It is said that some of them can die for more than 10 minutes. A people, an ethnic group of fishermen who for thousands of years have roamed the seas in a nomadic way, coming and going depending on food, living from fishing. Everything they needed, they got from the sea. People knew them as the people of the sea or the sea gypsies. Nowadays, science is trying to explain the reason for their amazing diving abilities, how they are able to endure so much underwater. And the results are surprising. It seems that this ethnic group has mutated over the centuries. And indeed, if this is confirmed, it would be the first record of a mutation in the human species. We are in Indonesia, and the report begins with the Baha people. I am really happy to be in this place. It has been a very long time since uh, I was waiting for this moment. This is really interesting for me, I promise. And if this report is well supported, I'm willing to continue researching about these ethnic groups and these fishing villages in different areas of the world. The Bashao are originally from here, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from the Philippines. There are other populations that have lived in similar conditions over the centuries in other areas like Thailand. What I say, a lot of support, and I continue with this series. And then, what we have just experienced this afternoon has been really fascinating, but it's just the beginning. This village that we're in is quite large. It has a mosque, it has a madrasa, it even has roads. It's on the sea. But rocks have been brought in over the years, and there are some areas with floors that they have prepared themselves. Others are directly bamboo walkways that look like they are going to fall at any moment. But what I say, there are also restaurants, there are two-story houses, even plasterboard in some areas, and there's even electric lighting. This is really big for what the Bajau lifestyle is, but what I'm saying, it's a main village. This is where we've arrived, this is where the adventure begins. We are in Samabahari, and from now on, we're going to investigate as much as we can about the history of these people, about their way of life. We will also learn about the different fishing techniques that they still use and their diving capabilities. We are going to visit other villages, and it's that many Bajau families are still nomads who build houses for the season of a specific fish, then abandon them and move to other areas looking for other fish. So, after going through this village, we are going to go in search of those nomadic camps, those seasonal camps. Now the sun has set, the night has come, but the day doesn't end. Here they also fish at night. First of all, let's have dinner. Seafood, of course, and then we will go fishing. I was looking forward to the sunrise, first to continue the adventure and then for you to see where we slept tonight. This is literally sleeping on top of the water. 
The first impressions are that these houses are amazing. I mean, how these people have managed to get them up on the water. It is quite surprising. And how everything moves when the wind blows is shocking. And then I was also surprised that there is a lot of garbage. It is very polluted, a lot of plastics, a lot of bottles everywhere. There is no bottom in the water, like the whole bottom is shit. You can see that there is a lot of human activity, that there are a lot of people who are doing activities, fishing. There are nets and bottles at the bottom, for I say about human presence, it's pretty dirty. Then I was also very surprised to find out which is the bathroom. There is no bathroom between the houses. Look at this. Well, we have slept here in this place, okay? This is the bathroom. People pee, people even shit on what would be the actual floor of the house and all the remains go directly into the sea. As simple as removing a board. This is the bathroom to pee over here, to shit over here too. And on top of that, it is required, literally, that if you are taking a shit, you wait for the night. Because if you're not going to do it here in the middle of the village, in the middle of the water, with people passing by with their boats right there. Another interesting and strange point here in these Bajau villages is that when we are going to eat fish, especially at night, since we go to sleep, it's necessary to wash our hands very well with soap. The reason? Because if not, the mice will come to bite you following the smell of this same fish. This is like a world apart. The day begins. Today is the big adventure. We will head inland towards the sea and search for the more nomadic settlements of the Baja people. can't believe where we just got to. Look at this incredible place. Look at where we are right now. We're in one of these Bajau settlements in the middle of the ocean, built right on the sea, and it looks really crazy to me. I find it really amazing, almost nonsensical, how they have survived after the passage of centuries here, living in these simple structures of sticks, of bamboo, with these more traditional wooden boats, an extreme lifestyle, only suitable, only possible if you know how to read and understand the sea perfectly, the currents, the waves, even the sky, the storms. On the way here, in fact, we were caught in a storm in the middle of the sea for a while. A strong wind started blowing, big waves were approaching, and obviously the boat is not very strong. It wiggles, it bounces, the water gets inside, and I ask myself, what happens here if you get caught in a strong storm? Will people die at sea? I have been told that this never happens to them, because first of all, there are not usually big waves here, strong winds, yes, but they know how to read the sky and the sea to prevent that from happening to them from being trapped. And I also find this aspect really fascinating, that they can read the weather in the moon, in the stars. They say that, for example, when at sunrise or sunset the sun turns really red, it means that a strong wind is coming. If they look at the sky at night and the stars seem to vibrate, seem to twinkle, it also means that a strong wind is coming. And with this information, with these readings of the climate, they decide whether to go out to sea or not. So as I say, this is a temporary settlement. Whole families do not live here. Only the men come here to fish. We are at the end of April, so it's the vacations after Ramadan, so there are fewer fishermen. 
It's okay, we have the settlement almost to ourselves. There is one more fisherman over there. But what we are going to do is live here for the next few days and fish, live on what we fish. So, this starts for God's sake. I'm really in that vibe right now where I find everything fascinating. Look at this, they brought wood, we're going to cook here. And I was saying, how are they going to keep from setting the whole structure on fire? What they do is this, they bring sand from the bottom of the sea, and so they make like a structure there, like a base, let's say, to be able to cook on the sand. And well, the days ending as the hours go by, the fishermen begin to arrive. Notice that there are different fishermen arriving in this area. All the houses that at first seemed to be empty, in many of them there are now boats. The fishermen at the end were out to sea too, fishing like us before, and once they have food, they go back to the settlement. This is how we face our first night on the ocean, in the middle of nowhere and at a short distance from the water. It's going to be a windy night, you can hear it, maybe with rain, maybe with storms. But well... Protected air, huh? Sheltered in this small dwelling made of planks and bamboo. For real, I am enjoying every detail. <laughs> of every little thing, like a little child, I swear. And I also asked them about the more spiritual part, if they still have those beliefs in the spirits of the sea, 
because nowadays they are Muslims, but it is indeed a more open Islam because it is more recent at the end. All this region of Indonesia is Muslim, but in the end, they keep part of their previous religious beliefs. So for example, things that in Islam you could not do, we can live with the Baha women, share time with them, and live with them, talk with them, photograph them. The men of those populations can, as you have seen, be diving practically naked in front of me, even when Irati is present, for example, or other women. In other words, it is like a much more open lifestyle. I have never seen them pray either. Maybe they have their beliefs or they go to the mosque from time to time, I don't know. But it's not like they do those daily prayers or follow the Muslim religion in an extreme way. So I asked them, do you still hold beliefs in spirits like in the past? They said, yes. They still worship the seas. They worship the ocean. They believe in this concept of the sea as a multiple entity, a set of entities like the spirits of the waves, of the currents, of the mangroves, of the reefs. It seems really interesting. And now, I have an easy question for you. Remember I talked about the almost superhuman diving abilities of the Bajo people? This facility, they have to hold their own underwater? The question I have is, how long can you be submerged under the sea? And also, how deep can you go without breathing? These are the amazing, almost inhuman, and truly incredible powers of the Bajo people. It is said that some of them can dive for more than 10 minutes. For more than 10 minutes underwater, they can also dive to a depth of 50 to 60 meters without coming to the surface to catch their breath. Not all of them can do this. For example, the people I'm with in this village go down to 10, 15 meters deep and can even spend two, three or four minutes submerged at the most, which is already quite a lot. So we are going to eat fish, the same fish we caught this very morning. They have cooked some of them as if they were dried. These fish have been left to dry near the fire all afternoon. Others have been cooked to eat with rice as they did at noon and others are going to be sashimi type that is raw without any preparation. So let's enjoy the dinner and tomorrow we will go back to the water. The underwater world awaits us and we will continue to learn more about all this. And well, to understand why they can dive so well. So let's have dinner and that said, let's get some rest. I still find it really crazy, these elements with which they dive so traditional. These materials 
I don't know if you have noticed, but they are traditional diving goggles. They are self-made goggles. They are wooden goggles, some kind of glass lenses or some kind of plastic lenses. And after the goggles, in addition, we have these fins, apparently rough, which are also handmade. They are plastic, but also made by them. So all this is prepared by them for diving. And the same with the spear guns. They are wooden spear guns like we have here. All this is also carved by them. The spear gun, fins, goggles, and the rest of the things they use to dive, which are not many, are their own. And notice that they are also quite good at it. Is known as heaven under the sea. That is as the underwater sky, the sky under the sea. You've seen it, it's full of fish, full of life. Not just this settlement, but the whole area. There's out there in the high seas a straight line for miles and miles full of settlements like this. It's a high bottom area. That is to say where it covers a little bit and there are all the offshore settlements there. So, nothing. Curious also that on our way here, we met other Bajau in different boats with a very curious and striking way of fishing. They fished with a kite. The kite was flying and the thread of the kite itself was moving the bait, the lure that is underwater attracting the fish. Furthermore, near these boats, there were many dolphins hunting, taking advantage of the help of humans who attract their prey in these ways, the ball of fish that must have been down there. So now we have come to this paradise beach and we are going to eat. just arrived a few hours ago to this settlement where we are going to spend the night. It is a much smaller settlement than the place where we slept on the first day. Also more humble, more rudimentary, and fewer fishermen live here. We've been eating crabs when we got here. All their food sustenance comes directly from the sea, fresh and natural. It is also curious to arrive at a settlement and suddenly have a dangerous sea snake passing under the house. You see it between the cracks and they tell you, look, that one has the same poison as a cobra. Fuck, the children are bathing there. It's like they live together, just like the jungle has to coexist with the boas, with the jaguars. Here they say there are no sharks, but there is the issue of sea snakes. And I have also asked them where they get their water from. The drinking water, fresh water. Nowadays, it is true that they can also buy it. They told me that before, they either got it from the rain or they went to the islands to get drinking water from the lakes. And now, 
I want to talk to you about, I think, the key question in all this report, and it is that these Bajo, these families that have been living in the sea for thousands of years, diving to survive, it could be that precisely because of natural selection over all these centuries, they have become a specific race, more like an ethnic group of divers, genetically stronger. Well, this is, like I say before, it's really interesting. I suppose you all know what the spleen is, right? The spleen is an organ that we all have on this side of the body. The human body has something known as the dip reflex, something that is activated automatically when we go underwater, something that instantly causes that our heart rate to slow down and the heart pumps less blood. Our blood vessels constrict and also on the other hand, our spleen contracts. And now I'll explain what happens with this. The spleen is a reservoir of oxygenated red blood cells. So when we are underwater and the spleen constricts, it releases these oxygenated red blood cells into the blood and our body has more oxygen. That is, it can last longer underwater. Mammals, such as seals, which can stay underwater for so long while swimming, have an exaggerated size of the spleen compared to the rest of its organs. What about the Baja? They compared the size of the Baja spleen with other ethnic groups in the area. Even the Baja are believed to have come from the Salwan ethnic group. They separated from them thousands of years ago. Then they compared the size of their spleen with that of the other groups. Okay, so the spleen of the Bajau is up to 50% larger than that of the rest of the people that they studied. And this is the explanation given by science nowadays for the high capacity of the Bajau people to dive and to live in underwater worlds. But the subject did not stop there. They went even further. They continued testing and testing on these populations of divers. The scientists measured the spleen size of different Bajau persons, not only of the divers who can go so deep and for so long, but also of those who stay on the surface and don't go underwater. What they saw is that all Bajau, regardless of whether they have ever dived in their lives or not, have spleens about 50% larger. This seems to confirm that the Bajau have indeed evolved over the centuries to be able to dive better than the rest of people for real. So now we are going to rest from our days on the high seas here in the same town. I'm going to pick up my feet now. It's possible that there are sea snakes and they poison me. Also, I'm going to remove myself from these tables. It's not going to be I that mean, they break, really. These boards, these and all of them, look like they're going to break at any moment. The greatest adventure of being with the Bajau is walking through their villages. So we rest, and tomorrow we return to the first day's village, where the adventure continues. What I have before me are the materials with which they carry out another style of fishing, not only here in this area with the Bajau, but in many other areas and islands of this country, of Indonesia. This is something that is not only interesting, but also dangerous and also illegal. For fishing, they use a homemade explosive. This is not a tutorial on how to make an explosive. I'm not going to show you how to make it. Besides, we are not going to use it either. If we used it, we would be ourselves, especially the Bajau in legal jeopardy. The government is pursuing these techniques in a very strong way. They are able to make a bomb with elements as, as I say, you are not going to see here in any part of the process, but with elements as rudimentary as a bottle, whether it is a bottle of a soft drink, a beer with rice, with a few matches, with cotton. With only this and a couple of other ingredients, which of course I will not say, but within everyone's reach, they can make a bomb that they use, not in the middle of the sea, of course, but they have to go to the cliffs, to the reefs, to the areas where there is a lot of fish, where there is a lot of seafood, where there is a lot of life. So not only do they get to kill a lot of fish and marine life and get good rewards, but they destroy the ecosystem in this savage way. The areas where these explosives have been used during the last decades are completely devastated. They are dead corals. There is no life there anymore. We are talking about a technique that is still used in some parts of the country. Here, I do not know if they are, if they are not. Let's leave it at no for the safety of all. But of course, they know the techniques because they have been using them for a long time. So what I say, an interesting subject, but at the same time, dangerous and illegal.
I would like to finish this report by sharing with you some of my personal conclusions. The reality is that I have been reading and researching for a long time about the Bajau people, about their history, and especially about their capabilities. There are many videos on YouTube that talk about it, but they are of people who do it from the comfort of their home. Few people bother to come here to look for them, and getting here has also cost me a lot of research time. Seriously, getting to this place has taken me a lot of work, because there are other Baja who live practically in the city and who are much more modern. So, coming here have been an adventure at the one of the most authentic and traditional Bajo areas of all Indonesia. Although I know that in other countries, maybe we can find something even more authentic, more traditional. And that is why I say that my duty is, and also with this desire that I have to keep on investigating. The thing is that many of these videos simply read the studies that are already published on the internet. These are people who, yes, have read some articles, but they have not been here. They do not know the reality. And then all the studies that I see in the BBC, in National Geographic, in all the web pages, in all the press, refer to the exact same scientific study. That is to say, it is not that many people have checked it or investigated it, but that many media are sharing the same information that comes from the same source. I don't deny that there are Bajau who have the ability of dive a lot more than the rest of the people, but I think that I can confirm something. Not everyone can. Nobody here knows people who can dive more than 30 meters or more than three, four at the most. Five minutes, they don't know anybody. I have asked in different towns to different families and persons. I have even asked if their grandparents could do it. Historically, none of them here know anyone who has such incredible abilities. So, of course, don't get me wrong. I'm not trashing the work of those scientists. I am simply saying that perhaps it is only a few specific individuals who are capable of such things and not the entire Bajau people. I will continue investigating and I hope to be able to reach other towns and, and I really would love it. I am the first one who wants to find these authentic, almost superhuman divers. They also talk about the Bajau rupturing their eardrums as children in order to be able to dive deeper. And it is said that many die young from decompression sicknesses, diseases caused by diving, by nitrogen in the blood. They don't have that problem here either. They have to compensate also in the ears. That is to say, they do not have ruptured eardrums. And they don't go down so much, so they don't have these diseases from diving and amnia. And above all, this is what I dedicate myself to. Although we all like more history that circulates on the internet, even I am much more passionate about it. I hope I can find a reality like it is in other towns. But here I come to document the reality, and the reality that I have found is that. But what there is no doubt about is that it is a fascinating way of life, and of course they live from the ocean, they live on the sea. The first reports on the Bajau date back to the year 1500 and something. The first European explorers who arrived in the area around the world had already dated about these Bajau living on the sea surface while they made their trips. So the history is true. These people live by the sea, they lead a fascinating life, connected with the tides, with the currents. And that's what I keep. That's fascinating. And the diet. Wow, how we have been eating these days with these fish marinated in lemon, as if it were a ceviche. Fish broths, grilled and raw fish, like cooked on a barbecue. I have really enjoyed eating here. On the other hand, I have been shocked by the pollution issue. Here they don't have any concept of pollution, of not throwing plastics into the sea. It's true that in Europe we were like that a few decades ago, but it is surprising, isn't it? A town so connected to the sea and that every bottle that ends up in the water, I'm going to finish, I don't want to go on any longer. Maybe these people also have such a big spleen. Obviously, I have not been able to do that scientific study. I have no way to prove it. Maybe they do, but maybe their diving capabilities are not that great, right? I will continue to investigate. I want to continue with this series and hopefully find those people who have their spleen adapted in such a way that this organ is like a diving bottle built into their own body because that idea fascinates me. So thank you very much. Maximum support and hopefully we will soon be sailing the seas in search of the nomads of the sea.